Iran and Hezbollah are threatening war against Israel, and the Biden administration is scraping and groveling before the Iranian Ayatollahs. I'll have details coming up on In Focus. So before we start, I might as well tell you what this new scenery is. I am on the road this morning. I'm in San Antonio, Texas, visiting the Lone Star State, which is just terrific. As soon as I got here and I saw the Don't Mess With Texas t-shirts, I felt right at home. Anyway, um, I'll be in Texas for the next few days and then Washington, D.C., and then down to sunny Florida en route to sunny Israel. So You'll be seeing probably a little bit less of me in the coming uh, two weeks. I'm sorry, uh, busy, but uh, I won't abandon you completely. And in the meantime, I wanted to give you some thoughts about what's going on on the ground in Israel from Texas. So as I said in the headlines um, on Sunday night before I left Israel, um, there was a strike in Damascus on an Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps building adjacent to the Iranian embassy in Damascus, and it quickly became clear that uh, the people who had been inside of the building were some very, very, very senior people in the Revolutionary Guard Corps. In fact, this is the most senior person. His name is General Riza Zahedi, um, who is basically uh, Qasem Soleimani's um, replacement uh, as the head of the IRGC uh, operations, terrorist operations outside of Iran. So Zahedi was overseeing all of Iran's terrorist operations in Lebanon and with the Palestinians, with Hamas and other terrorist organizations. And he was in Damascus. And together with him, he was killed on Sunday night in the airstrike, as was his deputy and several other top Iranian terrorists who were working from the terrorist uh, center in Damascus adjacent to the Iranian embassy. And the uh, attack is being attributed to Israel. And in response to this attack, and this was after Iranian-controlled Iraqi uh, forces shot a ballistic missile at a lot uh, over the weekend, and they hit a building in the uh, in Israel's naval base uh, on the port of a um, in the port of a lot in the Red Sea. So um, then there was this attack on Sunday night in Damascus, where essentially Iran's top terrorist leaders were taken out. And these were the leaders that were overseeing Iran's terrorist operations with Hezbollah. This guy, Zahedi, was in daily contact with Hezbollah chief Hassan Nasrallah uh, and directing Hezbollah's war against Israel uh, in Lebanon, among many, many, many other things. These were people who had just, you know, rivers and rivers of blood on their hands, and they're dead now. The world is a safer place. So in response to this attack that's been uh, credited to Israel, Iran has threatened or promised or pledged to avenge the attack by attacking Israel directly. Among other things they threatened to attack is uh, the building of the Israeli foreign ministry in Jerusalem. Israeli embassies throughout the world are on very, very high alert, as are all Israeli installations. So you have missile defense uh, uh, batteries on full alert in Israel and expectation or anticipation of an Iranian strike from Iran. But in addition to the Iranian direct threats on Israel, you also have, and I think the CIA put out this report that they project that within, you know, a day or two, Iran is going to attack Israel. So that's, uh, that's Iran directly. And then you also have had Hezbollah broadcasting, you know, the Shiite version of uh, war marches on uh, Lebanese radio since Sunday and threatening uh, to go to war with Israel and uh, to avenge Zahedi's uh, uh, death, etc. So I would say that as a result of essentially decapitating much of Iran's terrorist leadership in Damascus, um, it, it, we may now see the big war that we've all been fearing, as opposed to the smaller war that's been going on, which is quite large, of course, in Gaza between Hamas and, and Israel, Iran's uh, terror proxy in, in Gaza, Hamas's terror war against Israel, 
that's been the main focus with additional fronts being uh, very, very dangerous, but still not a full on frontal confrontation, a conventional war like we've been seeing on the ground in Gaza. Um, so we may be seeing that. In addition, we've had even before the uh, attack on Zahedi and his and his uh, terror master colleagues, we had following the attack from Iraq, we had uh, agitation and claims that there is an army of 12,000 Iranian-controlled jihadists in Jordan today that are poised to invade Israel from Jordan. So opening up an eastern front, we've already had a series of attempted infiltrations and apparent infiltrations by Jordanian terrorists into Israel since October 7th. And the whole Jordan Valley area, which is the border zone with Jordan along the Jordan River, has been much hotter in recent months and with an escalation in recent weeks than we've seen it really in decades. So that's one aspect. And also you have Hamas in recent week, I think it was last week, threatening to overthrow the Hashemite regime in Jordan and take over Jordan, which a majority of its citizens are actually uh, Palestinian and they overwhelmingly support Hamas. We've had mass, very violent demonstrations outside of the Israeli embassy in Amman uh, by these Hamas supporting groups. And initially they were um, facilitated or not, not discouraged or uh, treated with kid gloves by the regime in Amman. But after the direct threats to the regime on the part of Hamas uh, to take over the regime and oust the Hashemite, uh, the Hashemite monarchy from power, you've had a much stronger arm being used uh, against the rioters outside of the Israeli embassy because the Jordanians are suddenly realizing, lo and behold, that it isn't the Jews that they're after. First, their first mark is the regime itself. So you have the Eastern Front, you have the Houthis escalating their attacks when they're not crucifying homosexuals, which is something else they've been doing down there in Yemen. And then you have Lebanon and Syria and Iran. So this is a very big deal. And, um, and uh, <laughs> you know, you gotta wonder, okay, so this is what's happening. Uh, what's the United States doing? Um, you know, they're supposed to be on Israel's side in the war against Iran. Iran is supposed to be the big other side, I guess, in this. And all of the terror arms that it's operating, sort of like an octopus, they're all Iran satellites. So the United States is supposed to be Israel's supporter or Israel's uh, power that's behind Israel, right? Well, no, 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 no. Um, Robert Wood, the U.S. Deputy Ad Ambassador to the United Nations, gave a statement on Tuesday um, in the face of these Iranian threats of war. And this is what he said. We will not hesitate to defend our personnel and repeat our prior warnings to Iran and its proxies not to take advantage of the situation. Again, an attack in which we had no involvement or advanced knowledge to resume their attacks on U.S. personnel. So they're saying, we didn't have anything to do with Israel strike. They didn't tell us ahead of time. We didn't approve it. We didn't green light it. We didn't know anything about it. Please don't attack us. To which Iran responded, their deputy, their deputy ambassador to the UN, a lady named, I think it's a woman named Zahra Urshadi. She said, the United States is responsible for all crimes committed by the Israeli regime. She accused the United States of trying to destabilize Syria and the region and calling it out for supporting Israel in its war against Palestinian militia Hamas. So, you know, the United States is like, we didn't do any of this. And Iran says, no, no, no. The great Satan and the little Satan, the United States and Israel are two sides of the same coin, which is why since 1979, we've been calling for the annihilation of both. 1979 being the Islamic revolution that brought these lunatics to power, right? So they've been calling for the annihilation of both the United States and Israel, and they don't care whether the United States supports Israel or not. From their perspective, the United States and Israel are one and the same, and they're going to come after the United States. And by the way, it's very important to point out that the same terror master, Riza Zahedi, who was taken, allowed, allowed, taken out purportedly by Israel on Sunday, was also responsible for all the attacks that were carried out against U.S. soldiers in Iraq, in Syria, um, and, and around uh, the region, and also from Yemen by the Houthis that is directed by Iran. He was responsible for all of those attacks against U.S. forces and personnel, including the attack 
the missile attack on U.S. personnel that killed three U.S. soldiers in Jordan along the border, the tri-border area between Jordan, Syria, and Iraq. So this is a man not only with rivers of Israeli blood on his hands, but also with American blood on his hands. And that's not even discussing his role in killing thousands of American servicemen in Iraq and Afghanistan since 2001. So this is an American enemy and the United States is saying we had nothing to do with it. We didn't take any action against him, which I would assume is true because the United States really isn't giving Israel that much support apparently in this war at this level anymore. And so they may be telling the truth. Maybe they didn't have anything to do with it, assuming that the allegations are correct and Israel took them out. And I don't think Israel has actually been making any effort to deny the fact that uh, we apparently did uh, take him out with uh, with our aircraft. So, you know, here's the United States washing its hands saying we didn't have anything to do with it. Please don't attack us. Please don't attack us. And I think one of the main messages that comes through very clearly from Wood's statement, and he wasn't the only one who made it, is that the United States is behaving in a cowardly fashion. Because here's an Iran. It's been carrying out all of these attacks against U.S. personnel. And um, the United States, rather than standing up to this bully, is bowing and scraping before it. Please, please, please don't do anything to us. Don't do anything. We didn't have anything to do with this. And if you want to retaliate, only kill Jews. That's essentially the message that the United States is relaying not only to Iran, but of course to Israel, and also to the Sunni Arab states that are equally threatened by Iran. I mean, the Iranians also just, uh, through the Houthis, they said that they were about to expand their their attacks, their ballistic missile attacks, their cruise missile attacks against Saudi Arabia. Why? Because they claim that Saudi Arabia is allowing the United States to operate from within its territory, from bases inside of Saudi Arabia, in its efforts to intercept missiles being launched by the Houthis at the direction of Iran, at the direction of people like Zahedi, who Israel apparently killed on Sunday in Damascus. So you have this whole system of Iranian aggression that's all directed from Tehran and by Iran's emissaries in places like Syria, Gaza, Yemen, and Jordan, and of course Lebanon, which is controlled by Iran's Hezbollah proxy. And the United States, rather than you know face this reality squarely and and deal with the fact that Iran is doing this to the United States directly, attacking U.S. positions in the Middle East directly, and also threatening and attacking and waging war against the United States' allies, first and foremost Israel, but not only, also Saudi Arabia, the UAE, and other states. The United States, again, is groveling before the mullahs and saying, please, please, please don't attack us. We didn't do it. It was the Jews. It was the Jews. It was the Jews. So this is, you know, an absolutely terrible message that the United States is communicating by making these kinds of statements. But it isn't only, you know, these kinds of statements that are making the case that the United States is is just in a, in a strategic collapse vis-a-vis -vis Iran. It's also obviously the direct actions that the United States has taken on behalf of Iran, first and foremost, the non-enforcement of sanctions and unfreezing uh, ill-begotten funds that have been frozen in South Korean uh, bank accounts and in bank accounts in Qatar and other countries that have literally moved tens of billions of dollars into the coffers of the Ayatollahs since Biden came into office. And as recently as last month, I believe there was another transfer and another transfer a week after the October 7th invasion by Hamas's Palestinian proxy Hamas. So you have all of this money that the United States is enabling to move to Iran, tens of billions of dollars since Biden came into power. And that money, as everybody knows, including the United States, including John Kerry, who acknowledged it at the time that he was signing the nuclear deal with Iran that ended the U.S. sanctions on Iran, he knew that the money was going to be used to fund terrorism. So by not enforcing these terrorist sanctions and then unfreezing, directly unfreezing funds that are moved immediately to the coffers of the Iranian Ayatollahs, the United States enabled Iran to finance its invasion of Israel, its uh, building up of the armaments of groups, including Hezbollah and Hamas and the Houthis, which are being directed by an Iranian spy ship. And the United States' response to that is twofold. One is only defensive uh, actions against the Houthis, right? You're saying, okay, we're just intercepting missiles en route to their targets. We're not going to, you know, take serious action in Yemen to bring down the Houthis, to dismantle 
this terror regime that's you know in control of large swaths of Yemen and particularly the strategic choke point of the Bab el Mandeb and and enacting an illegal maritime blockade of the Red Sea through their control of the Bab el Mandeb. The United States not taking that kind of strategically significant action against Iran at all. It's only intercepting missiles. That's it. It's an amazing thing. They only have a defense team. And then at the same time, they're enabling Iran by unfreezing and not enforcing, unfreezing resources and not enforcing sanctions and distancing themselves from the little Satan, from Israel, from the state of Israel. The great Satan is saying, we're not there. We're not with them. Essentially, we're with you, Iran. And if it wasn't enough, that direct appeasement of Iran, that direct sort of groveling before the mullahs, you have America doing two things to undermine Israel's own war effort, first and foremost in Gaza. So the other day, I think it was on Monday, you had this very tragic um, event that happened on the ground in Gaza. It's a sort of tra in tragic event that happens in battlefields in every war, which is that when Israel, uh, in carrying out its legitimate and just war against Iran, there was a, carried out a drone strike. And in this, in this particular strike, as inevitably happens in every war, Israel accidentally killed uh, aid workers that were uh, in a convoy, apparently, in Gaza, carrying aid, and it was from a Western humanitarian organization called the World Central Kitchen, which is some little little uh, aid organization that's run by some uh, fancy chef. Anyway, so seven aid workers, including, I think, one American citizen, were killed in this convoy. Now, these sorts of things, again, happen. The United States had a similar occurrence in Afghanistan only recently, and 10 people were killed in that, and nobody cast aspersions on the United States of America as a result of this regrettable, regrettable tragedy that occurred uh, through an American drone strike in Afghanistan. Nobody said that the United States is evil, that the United States was deliberately trying to harm aid workers or block humanitarian aid from getting to needy people in Afghanistan. But that's exactly what President Biden did in response to this action that happened on the ground in Gaza on Monday. And remember, this is a war zone. And I just want to read um, uh, a bit of Biden's statement, Biden's presidential statement after this aid convoy. And we had, and you know, let's just put it into context. We'll do that afterwards. But first, I want to read this. I am outraged and heartbroken by the deaths of seven humanitarian workers from the World Central Kitchen, including one American in Gaza yesterday. They were providing food to hungry civilians in the middle of war. They were brave and selfless. Their deaths are a tragedy. Israel has pledged to conduct a thorough investigation into why the aid workers' vehicle vehicles were hit by airstrikes. That investigation must be swift. It must bring accountability, and its findings must be made public, even more tragically. Even more tragically, this is the kicker. Even more tragically, this is not a standalone incident. This conflict has been one of the worst in recent history in terms of how many aid workers have been killed. This is a major reason why distributing humanitarian aid in Gaza has been so difficult. Listen to this. Because Israel has not done enough to protect aid workers trying to deliver desperately needed help to civilians. Incidents like yes yesterday simply should not happen. Israel has also not done enough to protect civilians. The United States has repeatedly urged Israel to deconflict their military operations against Hamas with humanitarian operations in order to avoid civilian casualties. So you see what he did here? He it he he didn't even intimate. He accused Israel of responsibility of of malign action that caused this tragedy to happen. It wasn't, you know. It's a difficult situation. It's a crowded area. No, he said, he said, um, Israel has not done enough to protect aid workers trying to deliver Debra. Okay, we haven't done enough. What were we supposed to do that we haven't done? What in the history of American actions in war zones has the United States done in other uh, war zones that Israel isn't doing in in Gaza? And the answer to that is nothing, nothing. 
There is nothing that the United States did in other war zones that Israel isn't doing in Gaza in order to protect workers. But it's not even that. See, when the United States was in Iraq and inadvertently killed civilians, many, many, many in places like Fallujah and Mosul or in Afghanistan and did the same thing in those areas, Israel wasn't on the ground with personnel causing chaos terrain. But that's what the United States is doing actively in Gaza today. It's not just that they're airdropping these aid packages all over Gaza, right, that are, I would say, deliberately, but certainly, in effect, causing chaos terrain on the ground. You know, it's, you know, it's not just that or that they want to bring in a port right, who, in order to bring in unrestricted aid, it's that the United States, even though it knows this, that Hamas controls all of these aid convoys and that 60 to 60 percent of the of the aid is being siphoned off for Hamas for its own use. And by the way, none of it is going to the to the hostages there. Hamas has already made statements saying that one of the hostages died of starvation and that their goal and that they're from now on going to completely starve the hostages and make them all die of starvation. They put out a snuff film with a picture of a hostage showing that he had starved to death, which I have not seen and that has not thankfully been shown on the Israeli media at all. But this is what they're saying that they're doing. And the United States is insisting that we feed them, feed the people who are holding and starving the hostages to death. Okay, that's what the United States is doing. And they're ignoring the fact that this humanitarian aid that they insist on bringing into Gaza first and foremost serves Hamas. And more importantly, or just as importantly, I think that's the worst aspect to it, but Gaza is flooded with food today, right? I mean, I gave you the statistics a couple of weeks ago that the coordinator of government activities in the territories that's responsible for overseeing all of the aid convoys put out. The 200, over 200, 250, 236 was the last data point that I saw this week. Uh, uh, truckloads of aid is coming into Gaza, of food aid is coming to Gaza every day, okay? And that's way more. That's more than three times the amount of food that was entering Gaza before October 7th. So, you know, this is, the, the prices of food has gone way down in Gaza because now there isn't, the, there's no famine. People are not starving to death, again, except for the hostage that are being deliberately starved to death. But the United States stopped talking about them completely, except as like a little data point that they mention while they're clearing, clearing their throats. No, they're they're not paying attention to that. Samantha Power is saying that Israel is deliberately causing a famine in northern Gaza. This is simply not true. And then you have a tragic event like what happened on Monday with the aid convoy and and Biden is besmirching Israel. So, you know, that's just one of the aspects of it. And the other one is this is crazy, crazy report that came out yesterday, Tuesday, of a conversation that the senior administration officials, Jake Sullivan, the national security advisor, Tony Blinken, uh, secretary of state, had with Israel's national security advisor, um, Safiya Negbi, and strategic affairs minister, Ron Dermer, uh, regarding Israel's plan uh, op ground operation in Rafa, and in the readout of that uh, of of that um, meeting that they had, I think it was virtual meeting that they had um, on Tuesday. It was the United States that put out the statement saying that uh, that that Tony Blinken and uh, Jake Sullivan attacked the Israelis, saying we're not convinced, you're not serious. We don't trust you. Your humanitarian evacuation uh, plan for the people in Rafah is unrealistic. Uh, if you go at the at the rate uh, that you know, if you use the same speed to get them out that you use to bring humanitarian aid into Gaza, then we're talking about you know it's going to take you six months to let to get to resettle them outside of Rafah. You know, and all of this could be over tomorrow if the United States ended their inhumane, inhumane pro-Hamas, insanely anti-Israel position that nobody in Gaza should be allowed to seek refuge in a third country. You know, if the United States simply said to uh, Sisi, the head of uh, Egypt, right, if he, they just said to President Sisi, open up the border, let these people seek refuge in the Sinai, you know, for three weeks, put them in tents, in, in, in your side of the border for three weeks in El Arish or wherever, let them out, let Israel do its business, and then they can go home. 
If they did that, there would be no humanitarian problem because there would be no war anymore because it would be over. But since October 7th, the U.S. position has been, under the Biden administration, that nobody is allowed to leave Gaza and Israel is completely responsible for this population. And here they come and they say to the top officials in Israel that they tried to summon to Washington, but they ended up having to suffice with the remonstrating them on Zoom. So they say, oh, you know, just like speaking to Israel, like we're like these kitchen servants or something like that, that, you know, brought their coffee to them cold. No, we don't take you seriously. You know, you're you're nothing. You're 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 dirt under our feet. We're going to stomp on you. We're going to humiliate you. And then we're going to leak what we say to you in this incredibly horrible conversation to the media so that you can be humiliated internationally and so that the Iranians will know that we mean business when we say, you know, we didn't do anything to your general. We didn't do anything. Please don't hit us. Please don't hit us. Direct all of your fire at Israel. And don't worry because we're going to blame Israel if it responds and anybody dies. Okay. That's, that's what we're seeing from the Biden administration. It's really tragic because, you know, it's not going to, it's not protecting the United States at all. It's inviting additional aggression because everybody who's ever gone to school knows that if you're facing a bully, the last thing that you should do is give him your lunch money, right? Because then he's just going to come back and, you know, demand your parents' college savings account for you. And that's precisely what the dynamic is at play here. You know, the United States is not standing up to Iran. And so Iran keeps upping the ante and upping the ante and upping the ante. Not only vis-a-vis -vis Israel, but vis-a-vis -vis the United States as well. What do they think is going to happen now? Iran is going to, you know, give a pass and let, and, and then to what effect? What is the purpose? If you're not going to actually defend your interests, your people, you know, all you'll do is intercept cruise missiles if you're lucky on their way there, right, with your Patriot missiles. You know, it's like, why do you have forces in the Middle East? What are you trying to accomplish? I mean, you're not defending anything, right? So why are you there? Now, you're letting everybody walk all over you, whether it's the Chinese or the Russians and obviously the Iranians, etc. What What does the United States gain from having a presence in the Middle East if nobody takes them seriously because they're bowing and scraping and groveling before the mullahs? You're not actually accomplishing anything from a national security perspective. You're undermining your own position. Might as well leave. And by the way, if the United States left and just let the chips fall where they may, Israel in a way would be better off. Because right now what we have is America actively subverting its position in a war and trying to block it actively, openly, from winning the war to defeat Hamas. Not to mention, you know, what they're doing vis-a-vis -vis Lebanon, where they're literally, Amos Hochstein's position is that Israel should give up, we've talked about this before, Mount Dove in the Golan Heights, which the United States recognizes as being part of sovereign Israel to Hezbollah in order to maybe convince them to give us another couple of weeks of quiet so that we can bring all of our civilians who were unlike the godsons were evacuated out of the war zone right after october 7th to keep them safe and away from harm but we have all of our border cities are now ghost towns right because we can't allow them to come back until we push hezbollah far enough away from the border to prevent them from being invaded the way that the towns adjacent to to gaza were invaded on october 7th so the united states is saying okay this is the Biden administration's position. Fine, let's talk about how you let your internal refugees back in. You let them back home by paying, uh, by giving into Hezbollah's blackmail and giving them Mount Dove, which is this massive area in the Golan Heights that controls all of northern Israel down to the Gulf of Haifa. Give them that, and then you can come back in. But how will we live? We'll live under the umbrella protection of Hezbollah? You can't. I mean, you know, we have family that lives in Kiryat Shmona, and we would not recommend that they go back, and they're not stupid. They know what missiles are. They've been facing missiles since the PLO started shooting Katusha rockets at them in the 1970s. They're not going to come back under those conditions. But that's what the United States' position is. Pay protection money to Hezbollah in the form of strategic territory that's part of your sovereign territory. It's not even in contention. And then, you know, people in Kiryat Shmona and in Daphna and in, and in, and in, uh, and in Kvargiladi and all of the other towns and villages and Menara and, and Metula, they can all come home. No, they can't. But that's the American position on that. You know, 
And then the, the idea that we're maligned, that Jews are maligned, that our military forces actively seek the starvation and suffering of the people of Gaza when that's just projecting what Hamas is doing onto us, their, their target and victims. You know, all that does, or not all that does, among other things that it does, is that it enables anti-Semitism in the United States because it speaks directly to the people on college campuses and in cities and towns around the United States who say that Jews who support Israel are supporting genocide, supporting genocide, supporting war crimes and war criminals, etc., because the United States is making these allegations. And then the funny thing is, I guess maybe to avoid these kinds of accusations on the part of people like myself, they, they put out these statements, the president says this, right, that, you know, Israel is has not done enough to protect aid workers trying to deliver desperately needed help to civilians, even though they're awash with food, but forgetting about that for a second, you know, then they say, okay, no, 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 we didn't mean it. And they, and they send out the good cop, Jim Kirby from uh, the, 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 the spokesman for the national security council he says, oh no, Israel doesn't deliberately target. We never said that Israel deliberately targeted the civilian uh, humanitarian aid convoy. Well, you know, that's gaslighting. That's gaslighting. You put out these statements denouncing Israel, the president, the vice president of the United States of America does that. And then like a few hours later, they send out Jim Kirby to throw us a bone. This isn't a serious foreign policy. This is a this is a dangerous policy. It's dangerous, obviously, for Israel, but it's dangerous for the United States of America. Anyway, those are my thoughts here uh, from San Antonio, Texas. And uh, I'll uh, give you some more uh, thoughts next week or later this week. I don't know. Um, uh, as I uh, continue on my travels here in the United States of America. And the good thing I can tell you, though, is that you know, I only got here yesterday. I've only spoken in a couple of places, and I was happy to be on the Mark Levin uh, radio show uh, as well uh, last night. So if you're listening to me or watching me because you heard my Mark uh, nicely and really generously uh, uh, tell the, tell you all to, to watch the Carol Blick show, welcome and come back. Um, but... Um, you know, I mean, from the people that I've spoken to, including we were at this Mexican restaurant with uh, Congressman Chip Roy last night and his team, and the restaurant owner was just, he's, an, he's I think, a Mexican-American, and he was just effusive with his love for Israel. And, you know, maybe even more than uh, Congressman Roy, who I already know is a great friend of Israel, and it's fantastic, and his team, you know, the fact that just this restaurant owner came up to me and he told me that, he watched the 48-minute uh, uh, video film that Israel, uh, that the government has put out and had screenings of, of the atrocities that Hamas uh, carried out on October 7th. I was, I was profoundly moved by that. And uh, so I know that we're not alone, but I mean, the, that, and that's what makes it even more outlandish. In an election year, here you have the Biden administration pushing a policy that the polls show and my limited experience to date, and thankfully I'll be having a lot more experiences over the next couple of weeks here in America, you know, the polling and, and the personal connections that we make, I mean, it's just totally antithetical to the positions of the American people. It's a weird kind of election strategy, you might say, at a minimum. Anyway, those are my thoughts for today, and I'll talk to you guys later this week. In the meantime, uh, keep supporting Israel and keep tuned into this channel. See you soon. Bye-bye.